Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Safe Podcast. As you guys recall, on last week's podcast, we were discussing a novel called Brooklyn. On today's podcast, I'll be talking about one of the best selling movies ever made. However, I won't be talking about the movie itself. I'll be summarizing the first portion of his novel. The novel and the movie are called The Pursuit of Happiness. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Before I start summarizing, let me give you a brief summary of the main characters of the novel. There are six main characters in the first portion of the novel. Christopher Paul Gardner, the main character. Betty Gardner, Chris's mother. Thomas Turner, Chris's biological father. However, he does not play a significant part in Chris's life. Freddie Triplett, Chris's stepfather, a complete drunk and abusive person. Henry Gardner, Chris's uncle, whom he lives with after. And finally, Ophelia, Chris's sister. The first chapter was the beginning of everything. It starts off by us saying that Chris is very intelligent for his age. The chapter also reveals that Chris does not know who his real father is. However, the main turning point of the chapter is when Chris's mother, Betty Gardner, gets arrested. That meant that Chris and his two sisters had to be moved to foster homes. However, after she got released, Chris was full of joy, until he laid eyes on his new stepfather, Freddie Triplett. From that point, we could already tell the relationship wasn't going to be a healthy one, as he described Freddie Triplett as a dark, tall, not exactly handsome, drunk, abusive, and illiterate man. This is confirmed by the end of the chapter when Freddie Triplett tells Chris, I ain't your goddamn daddy. As we go deeper in the story, we see how smart Chris Gardner is and how abusive Freddie Triplett is. The ongoing saga with Freddie serves as a real turning point for Chris, who says my long-term plan had already been formulated, starting with the promise I made to myself that when I grew up and had some of my own, he would always know who I was and I would never disappear from his life. Living with Freddie was scary. Chris worried about the safety of his mother, who now slept on the living room couch with her shoes on, in case she had to run. That caused Chris to expand his long-term plan. He says, not only was I going to make sure my children had a daddy, I was never going to be Freddie Triplett. I was never going to terrorize, harm, or abuse a woman or a child. Years of abuse by Freddie led to Chris living on the edge. He became very, very paranoid. One evening, he was summoned to the living room by a sound from a man's voice that seemed to be threatening his mother. Chris responded by pulling out a butcher knife. The man was actually there to collect money and rent. That scene really showed us how abusive Freddie Triplett could be. Tired of Freddy's abusive ways, Chris's mother follows through on a plan to burn down the house while Freddy's asleep. She launches her plan one night after Freddy returns home drunk and passes out. How he woke up and stopped the fire, Chris never did learn. But he didn't know that Freddy used the attempt on his life to support his claim that Betty Gardner had violated her parole. As a result, she was sent back to prison. Losing his mother forced Chris to relocate again. This time, he moved in with his uncle and aunt. Another incident that occurred in Chris's life was when his sister Ophelia got sent to some detention home. Chris and his uncle Henry bonded a lot during their time. His uncle showed Chris the value in the smallest things in the world. However, the death of Uncle Henry was a crushing blow for Chris. Chris's world was rocked at Uncle Henry's funeral when he spots his mother and the female prison guard standing next to her. Whenever he got to visit or stay with his uncle Henry, it was obvious that Chris took away lasting lessons about the value of hard work, goal settings, focus, and self-education. As we enter chapter 4, we already know about Chris's financial problems. This forced him to learn more about money. For example, he learns loans and interest and how to get more value for less money. After he started to attend the white school on the east side, he soon realized what it felt like to have his color as his identity, to be looked down on, to be regarded as less than, to feel shame, or to be invisible. As the chapter begins, we get a sense that Chris is now in high school, likely his early teens. Chris and his buddies break into a home and garden show, a big annual convention. Once inside, the boys steal many music equipment. After returning home, Chris attempts to be Mr. Hustle when he tries to sell the stolen recording equipment to three men he meets in his apartment building. One of the guys jump on him, pushing him down as the other two gather up all the stuff and get out. Just when he thinks all hope is lost, one of the men who stole his stuff returns with money and some of the equipment. What first appeared to be a good thing, the man's arrival quickly turns and Chris finds himself in a world of trouble. As he describes it, the next slice of time, maybe 10-15 minutes or shorter, do not take place in normal time. Parts of his stretch out in slow motion and other parts are hard stoppingly fast. We soon learn that the man pulls a knife to Chris's throat and eventually rapes him. The language here is quite powerful. Following his rape, Chris feels alone. Eventually, he seeks out revenge, finding the man who raped him and crowning him with a cinder block as he exits a local store. We could see how Chris really evolved during these four chapters. He lost three important figures in his life, his mother, sister, and his uncle, and still keeps moving forward. 
If you want to find more about Chris's determination, make sure you tune into the next episode of Safe's Podcast. Until then, I'll see you later.